Hello. I um I gotta go do lawn work soon because it's warm out today. Um but I just wanted to post on uh Gerard DeHoof's latest talk and on the eternal black hole model. And if anybody wants to chit chat about that. <clears throat> Hello, if you want to chit chat, just say hi in the chat. Um, I'm just posting as I just listened to Gerard de Hooft. And at, at the very end, somebody um <clears throat> somebody asked him a question about um well is he he explains how when there's two different black holes in space, they have comm commutative operators in it for quantum field theory they're commutative but he's implying and that inside the black hole it is non-commutative and he doesn't use the word non-commutative but that's what he means because he says that um the time and the frequency are reversed for the ingoing photon into the black hole and then the outgoing photon. And he says that this is creates a paradox because you have time reversal, but he says that it has to be uh, purely quantum before classical space time exists. And, um, so, and then he says that it can only happen on the antipode of one um, of each black hole. But what he doesn't point out is that the topology of a um, sphere is for as an antipode is is symmetrical. And so, thanks. Um, somebody, or I don't know, but anyway, so when he says antipode, he doesn't, Hey, thanks. Yeah. I'm talking about, um, Ger Gerard de Hoof's latest, uh, eternal black hole talk. And I posted the link in the description. So I guess it'll, here, I, I can post it now. I think, let me see. Here we go. Yeah. So, um, I was just saying that, well, I have to go do lawn work soon, so I'll just make this quick, but um, it's, he has a, there's a, um, a little vul vulnerability in his talk because he says how the, <clears throat> his model relies on the antipode of the black hole in space time, but he doesn't realize that when you have a sphere, the antipode is symmetrical, but then he's saying that the, the, the antipode is purely quantum. And before you have H bar equals zero, when you have H bar equals zero, then you're, um, then you, you you have a classical, uh, particle. And so he, he explains how you're using, um, matrices, for the Hamiltonian operator and and but he doesn't he doesn't explicitly explain that that would be that would be non-commutative those those matrices are non-commutative but he does say it's purely quantum so the the sleight of hand is when he says it has to be an antipode of the um black hole but the antipode is in classical space time so the when, and then he says it's an instantaneous non-locality between the photon going into the black hole and the photon leaving as Hawking radiation. And so for from the observer per perspective, if you're outside of the black hole, you'll see light. But if you're inside the black hole, it'll just be pure uh, quantum information. The, okay, thank you for the question. The non-commutative is before size exists. 
and this is why it, um, it's it's a difficult concept that most like okay that's this is the problem with people when people learn classical physics first is because then they like I I also listened to um Peter White recently um. I posted in my blog and he talks about, he did an uh, interview with Lex Friedman um, and he describes this, a spinner. And I learned this my first year of college. It's, it's actually the only physics class I took. <laughs> what? Making sense in the cosmos seeking balance. Um, yeah. So actually, yeah, the idea here is you would not have balance that you would have an eternal flow of time. And Roger Penrose, he he calls this fundamental time, and it's a term he got from Lee Smolin. And Lee Smolin took his first quantum physics class from the same professor I took. And so basically, you know, the Herbert J. Bernstein, he uses this example of the um what they call the 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 Dirac, the Dirac dance. So you have this. You know, you go like that, but basically at each each zero point of space time, the have the the one half spin of the electron can only be seen as this 720 degree um spin as a particle, but it already exists and it's inherently non-local as one half spin. And so um you have this dichotomy because as as physicists is they say, well, you, the the quantum state it can't be the same as Lorentzian space time, which would be, you know, for general relativity. And so that's why you use this non commutative algebra because um, if you look at Basil J. Hiley's um, latest talk, it's it's really fascinating because he has he gives a talk to all these physicists in the live stream and even Roger Penrose, he's in on the the talk and they do not understand him because he's at the, at the very end of the talk, when he's answering questions, he says, you realize that this is all based on non-commutativity. And when he, when he mentioned non-commutativity in his talk, he was, he was talking about it in terms of the imaginary number for time. And so normally time is a real variable and so you don't have complex time. And that's what they're talking about. Fundamental time as a spinner is complex time. The, yeah, the identical in size. See, I wouldn't, it's an interesting way to put it, but this is before size exists because it's it exists as pure time and frequency. So so what, um. This Gerard de Hooft, he has a paper called Light is Heavy, and it's with Martin Vandermark. And Martin Vandermark passed on, he left his body. But um that art that article is a really great article. I'll give the I can give the link for it. Um Light is Heavy de Hooft Archive. Yeah, so if you read this article, um what they're what they're arguing arguing is that every particle of matter is actually fundamentally photons. It's made of photons, and there is not a center of mass in the photon. When you measure a photon, you cannot have a center of mass, and that's what that article explains. And then they say that because of one half spin of fundamental particles, whether it's protons or electrons, that that implies that the photon also has this one half spin to it because it doesn't have a center of center of mass. It's well see this is this is the thing. If if you watch um if you watch Tim Palmer, he explains that spin, quantum spin is neither a lay a wave nor a particle. And that's the key point of quantum physics is that one half spin is not a wave because a wave defined in physics mathematically is symmetrical. And then from that concept, you can get a particle. And so that so this um, actually Louis de Broglie he he discovered this on his own when he was critiquing relativity because he says when you have a particle that goes towards the speed of light in quantum physics, the energy goes up and so the frequency goes up. But in relativity, 
the particle um, slows down because of because the time gets bigger. And so all of a sudden you have both the frequency getting higher and the time getting bigger by a longer wavelength. And ever since Pythagoras from music theory, the frequency has to be inverse to time. And so Louis de Broglie realized that just on pure logic, there has to be a second time from the future that has a negative frequency and a time reversed wave. And so therefore it's um, essentially a quantum time frequency that he called the law of phase harmony. Right, that's, that's what classical physics says that time is space dependent. But this is the whole point that Lee Small and his whole career is arguing that time exists on its own. This is what Roger Penrose thinks also. He calls it fundamental time from Lee Smolin. And then um, Lou Kaufman calls it uh, primordial time. And uh, Alain Kahn calls it uh, primitive time. And those, all those terms are um, due to non-commutativity. They're based on non-commutativity. So before the Big Bang and after the end of the universe, only time exists and size does not exist. Yes, exactly. Time exists without a space-time of the universe. The, the oscillation is eternally happening all the time. So this is what the this is why it becomes um, what uh, Roger Penrose calls proto-consciousness. And if you if you go if you look at Roger Penrose's last two talks on YouTube, they're at, they're on the science of consciousness. Um, YouTube channel, and he it's all about precognition. He's saying that the proto-consciousness in, in our own brains is inherently precognitive, and you can access that through, like, extreme sports or through music. And, um, of course, this is what non-Western philosophy has been saying all, all along. They call it, um, I mean, precognitive visions are what, you know, so, but, but the, the problem, Penrose and Gerard de Hoof, they're both Nobel physicists, and they had a big debate um, on a live stream um, like three years ago, and the moderator cut them off. And I was like, hey, you know, you shouldn't have cut them off. They're two, two Nobel physicists, and they're debating. But they, they essentially, they say the same thing, but the problem is, is that obviously – the mathematics, the mathematical models are the non-commutativity. Like, like I just said, Gerard de Hooft, he never said the word non-commutative, but he he implies it, and he doesn't quite understand that when you have a black hole, and he's saying it has to be antipodal for the non-locality, but that's not true. Um, my own quantum physics professor, he uses the donut. He says it's a torus, and that's what he used to design his quantum uh, teleportation satellite system that NASA is NASA's testing right now. Only then can time exist between the universe. Yeah, this is what it, it implies because what Penrose is literally stating, he calls it the um, CCC, which is the cyclic um, conformal cosmology, something like that, or conformal, but um, cyclic cosmology, one of those. But what he's saying is that the acceleration of the universe is actually what's creating the Big Bang for the next universe. But the, how he explains this is that as the universe accelerates, eventually all matter will turn into a black hole singularity. And then based on Hawking radiation, and this will take like a Google of billions of years or whatever, he says that then that Hawking radiation, um, I lost my train of thought, but this is what he says that it will, it, it, that, that will actually, um, how does he explain it? But that, that will be a, a, um, basically like a negative frequency that will then 
create the the next big bang um inherently so um for the the next universe and it just keeps cycling like that but what he doesn't really explain and is that when that happens it's it happens in pure time what he calls fundamental time so in other words the 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 frequency that creates the new universe is in pure time and he i mean he says that outright he says there's no size at the uh, before the universe at the end of the universe <laughs> yeah the the multiverse the guy who created the multiverse um it's i think he has like a russian name and he's out on the west coast or something but he explains that actually the only way you can create another universe is to have energy that's faster than the heisenberg uncertainty principle but the heisenberg uncertainty principle of momentum and energy and um and location the energy and and the location are actually um originate from time and frequency in other words the Heisenberg uncertainty principle originates from the Fourier, what's called Fourier uncertainty, which is what Gerard de Hooft is using. He's using a Fourier analysis, and he he talks about the uncertainty principle in his talk. So, in other words, if you can create energy at faster than the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, then you can create new energy out of nothing, and that's precisely how meditation works as alchemy. Be, and because due to non commutativity, it's all based on not having the wrong mathematics that we don't understand the source of energy. But when you realize that the Western math originated from the wrong music theory, and the and as Alon Khan explains, the correct music theory is non commutative time and frequency. So what happens when you listen to the source of sound? It keeps resonating into this. Um, faster than faster than light uh, time and frequency. So you get a negative frequency that's actually guiding you from the future. And then that's a virtual photon. And they're, they're already doing that experimentally. They're already absorbing virtual photons and turning them into increased photons. Now, based on the classical physics model, that's not possible. So if you watch like PBS Space Time, which is a big channel, the guy will literally say that virtual photons are just a mathematical entity that do not exist because they go through renormalization. But even though there's already been experiments and the guy who was on the Nobel Physics Committee, he he replicated the experiment where you're creating uh, photons from virtual photons. You know, so it's it's fascinating that even that physicists, because they're brainwashed by classical physics and the symmetric mathematics that they they are literally in, in denial about the experiments that you know are already and there's another guy sir john pendry he's creating he's doing the same thing just using light as a circular light he calls it the um archimedes screw so you have the light like a spiral and then you're able to create a negative frequency and because of that you can absorb the virtual photons and that's exactly what you're doing in meditation they just call it turning the light around and you could store up the energy and then use that energy it's actually a, a space-time reversal also and so you're actually like accessing a black hole through biology and it just depends on how much you do it because obviously if you like sit in your room staring at your navel with your eyes closed you're going to get pummeled as like being lazy, you know, and a no good. <laughs> I mean, so that's why like, and you also have to maintain celibacy to build up the energy. And of course, as soon as your eyes are open, you're disconnecting your biology, you know, from this uh, source that's based on listening. And so then you have to do certain, um, you have to, I have, that's why I made my training manual. It's my first upload on YouTube is my um, free training manual. Uh, I, let's see, what's it called? Um, out, you go on, anyway, if you go to my first, uh, video, you'll find the link for it. So thanks for the comments and those are good. Uh, thank you, Mike Doze. Sorry if I mispronounced your name.
<laughs> but you have to remove every single oscillation that exists in order to remove time. Um, yeah, you're not removing time because time is eternal. It's a foundation. It's not time is not defined by space. It's a see, that's why it's based on listening. See, what they found is that if you start training in music uh, with an instrument at a young age before nine years old, you significantly, significantly increase your corpus callosum in the center of the brain. And that's what integrates the right and left sides of the brain. And now the right side of the brain is frequency dominant. So the problem is, is that by the time we're, you know, like 14 years old and we learn the Pythagorean theorem, and if we haven't done that early music training, which most people don't do, then they literally become left brain dominant. And so they're literally hardwired to be cut off from the source of reality. And so their brain's going to cut. It's been a proven fact that the left brain will lie about the right brain. And there's this psychiatrist, um, Ian McGilchrist, and he's like a you know a psychiatry professor or whatever, neurosurgeon or something like that, but a neuropsychiatrist. He, um, yeah, his whole career is ar arguing that you know right brain dominance is better than left brain dominance, and essentially like all of our problems of the world is, are due to left brain dominance. Well, I mean, one of the fascinating things is that your your vagus nerve that connects to your lower body. The, the left side vagus nerve does not connect to the right side of the brain, but the right side vagus nerve does connect to the left side of the brain. So if you're left, if you're left brain dominant, you're like being controlled by your subconscious because you're, you're not getting that vagus nerve connection that integrates the whole brain. Hey, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm supposed to be outside doing lawn work. So I, I'm, I got to get going soon, but I decided I just watched this, um, Gerard. I'm glad you like Mick Ilchris. Yeah, he doesn't, he talks about the brain, but he doesn't make the Vegas or my hair. I took a shower, then I wore a hat. <laughs> my, um, the, uh, you know, the connection to the Vegas nerve. that's what my uh, training manual gets into. But that, that also ties into Tantra too, because the, like for, for males, the reproductive, you know, trigger it it's it activates the sympathetic nervous system, whereas the vagus nerve is the parasympathetic nervous system. So for females, they stay in the in the vagus nerve, and so that's why for males, you know, they have to stay celibate or whatever. And and so um, that that was the core of our original human culture was requiring all males to do this training to like build up the female energy. And that's like, that then becomes psychic and it's tied to the lunar um, cycles. And it's through this right side vagus nerve connection to the uh, reproductive organ. So McGilchrist, I don't think he knows anything about that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the other thing is like, when you watch these, um, like Lex Friedman, does he ever talk about the ecological crisis? You know, like global warming. I mean, sometimes like uh, Sabine Hassenfelder, she just she's made like two or three videos on global warming. The first one, she admitted she didn't she didn't understand it. Or I think it was her second video. She said, well, the first video was wrong. And then she contacted Raymond Pierre Humbert. And I, I actually contacted him. I said, yeah, he she's talking about you. And that and he goes, yeah, she she contacted me before she made that video. You know, so that's a good thing. And then she she just made another video. But most physicists, they never they don't even really talk about. I think Roger Penrose, he mentioned it in passing. And he's like, yeah, he he thinks that we're doomed, you know, because of the global warming crisis. And they don't but they don't like make the connection to physics. It's like, well, maybe maybe our physics actually is really wrong, you know, because because if you look at the, if you talk about entropy, um, Penrose, he points out that gravitational entropy is the opposite of the entropy of matter. And so we're actually, if you realize that all matter is actually made of photons, um, as we try to decrease the entropy of matter through technology, we're actually increasing gravitational entropy of photons. And that's what global warming is, is that we're increasing the uh, infrared heat 
that foyer called dark dark um, dark heat. He called it dark heat. But anyway, so there's this it's there's this really fascinating connection between our ecological crisis and the wrong physics. But it's since the wrong physics are due to this symmetric commutative geometry, then any physicist that was trained first in classical physics, they're going to be hardwired not to acknowledge this problem. And so, you know, like even Basil J. Hiley, when I corresponded with him through email, he said, well, I've never discussed gravitational entropy. I've never worked on gravitational entropy. You know, so they, they admit. He he has some show he has some shows on that are focused on. I was gonna search his channel for it, so that's good to hear. I'll search I'll search his videos and look for it. Um. Yeah, he seems he seems pretty cool. He's not. I don't think he's really focused on it because I didn't. I looked through his videos and the ones on his page that he they must be a ways back, you know, because he hasn't had any video on it recently, like in the past, I don't know, six months or something. I don't, but, um, so what does that say? So books that support theoretical theory with math are not accurate. Yeah. Good point. Um, basically the non-commutative math, Alon Khan, he says that he says all of modern science is based on commutative geometry, and therefore almost all scientists consider non-commutative geometry geometry to be strange and a nuisance. And and Penrose literally in one of his talks he says he's not very good at non-commutative um, geometry, which is also called quantum algebra, and he says that he finds it a nuisance. So he used the exact same word nuisance that Kahn used, and so. The other thing is that, um, you know, people, they'll ask me for a mathematical equation. They're like, well, you don't have any equations. Well, along Khan, he the equation he uses, he just says it's 2, 3, infinity. And he, and he says that music theory is the simplest way to explain uh, non-commutativity. Well, the 2, 3, in, the two, three infinity is that, that is, that's music theory. But, um. It's actually non-Western music theory. So every human culture has music, but of course now it's now it's mainly Western music, which was the actual um, source of commutative geometry. If you look at, you know, how commutative of irrational magnitude it developed out of music theory, but it was the wrong the wrong music theory. And so you have this, like people will they'll often connect music with mathematics, and then they'll connect mathematics with physics. But they don't really they don't want to acknowledge that there's a direct connect like only Alan Khan, he's the only one who makes that direct connection with his music of spheres lecture. And he's given that music of spheres lecture like four times that on that's been posted on YouTube. So um of course he did his PhD on uh, non-commutative geometry. And but his whole thing is he's trying to um he's trying to integrate it back into classical physics or commutative geometry. Well, um, the, as Basil J. Hiley points out, because Basil J. Hiley, he's an actual physicist, whereas Alain Kahn's a math professor, but Basil, Basil J. Hiley, he says that in terms of biology, you can have the non-commutativity go into the macro scale and you don't, you, you don't need the, you should not use a wave function. And first of all, this is one of his big points. But also, because you're not using the wave function, there's no need for a collapse of the wave function. There's no longer any quantum jump that everybody hears about, like quantum jump. So because it, in terms of biology, he's, he even points out in a 2022 article, a book chapter on quantum consciousness, he says that all of quantum biology has been assuming that you're going to have this collapse of the quantum wave function, and therefore you will lose quantum coherence at the macro scale. He says that is not true. That is not true due to non-commutativity. You can have quantum coherence into the macro scale. Now, that's the whole point of alchemy as non-Western meditation is as soon as you realize this non-commutative. Well, I mean, they don't call it non-commutativity. I, I was calling it complementary opposites in, 
until I, you know, discovered a long con um, great in greater detail, but it was the same concept from non-Western music theory. Uh, there's a guy, Eddie Oceans, and he, he realized that non-Western meditation is the secret of it, of Ne Gong as internal uh, martial arts is due to non-commutativity. And he coined the phrase quantum psychology. He was hired to work at uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center as a physicist. Okay. Um, the, the vortex, yeah. So I wouldn't see my whole thing is like, we all, we always, as Westerners, especially as Westernized people and everybody, you know, we want to externalize everything, but I just the like, we already exist within this non-locality, this non-local, non-commutative free energy that we can access just through meditation training. And the, there's this book called Taoist Yoga, Alchemy and Immortality. It's a free book on, online. And it's actually, it's a training manual. There's 16 chapters. So you can just read that manual and then start practicing it. And it's all based on this um, Taoist alchemy training called the small universe, which is the 12, the 12 music notes of the scale, but it's an infinite spiral that you, you visualize and you listen to the source of the energy on the 12 points along the, the along the outside of your body. Actually, you want to work your way to the inside of the body, the center of the body. Um, and um, I have a book, uh, another free book called uh, Ancient Advanced Acoustic Alchemy. And I'm documenting that this same practice is found in Kriya Yoga based on the three gunas, which is the oldest philosophy of India. So they have that same 12 notes of music around the body. And it's also found in the Pythagorean Egyptian alchemy training. And so in other words, um, anybody can uh, build up this free energy and it, it also, you can use it to heal other people. Um, you can, it's, it just depends on how much you store up the energy. Well, storing up the energy inside your body is difficult for the reasons I just mentioned. Cause as soon as you open your eyes, you're disconnecting your biologically, you, you have that disconnection with the source. And that's why it's all based on meditation, but it's also based on certain um, body exercises. You know, my, I go like, that was the problem with the Taoist yoga alchemy immortality book is that he just assumed that people reading the book were also doing um, standing exercises as martial arts. Cause he was from a martial arts lineage in, um, in China. And so the book was for his students and he never even once um, talked about uh, any standing exercises in, in the, in the book. So I, I didn't realize that the, you have to maintain those standing exercises as the foundation of the practice. And at Shaolin, they do the traditional training is where you have like your thighs parallel to the ground, you know, for two hours, nonstop. Um, my, the teacher I trained with Chun Lin, he trained at Shaolin and he did that for six hours a day. Maybe his thighs weren't parallel to the ground, but just doing six hours with your knees bent, you know, and, um, that's just to open up the third eye. He did that every day for three months. And then his third eye was fully open after that. And then he did 28 days in a cave of nonstop, uh, full Lotus meditation at, um, Mount Ching Chen. And then when he finished that, when he came out, he was in full Lotus meditation. Then he spiraled up nine feet as anti-gravity. You know, he levitated up nine feet. And so unless you experience his energy directly, it feels like a laser and he can see inside your body. And so the point is, is he says, you know, reality is holographic. And he, he read the book, um, The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot. And that's based on um, David Bohm's physics. But they're just using holograph as a um, analogy without really understanding the, you know, the real, like the real logic of the non-commutativity is to theorize is only useful. Right. Right. Like what I'm doing right now is I'm just talking, but meditation, obviously you want to quiet your mind and listen, listen to the source of your thoughts. One of the, one of the key practices is the, all of our thoughts are based on the I thought or a sense of I. 
And so the very first thought we have on a waking, waking up, we have this sense of I. And so when you meditate, all you have to do is whenever a thought comes in your head, you just logically infer that that thought is based on your I thought. And you literally just will repeat I, I, I in your mind, but not as a mantra, but as a logical experiment to see. So whenever you have a thought arise, you immediately realize it's based on your sense of I. And then you start listening to the source of your I thought. And and you keep doing that. And eventually you're able to empty out your thoughts and then focus on the source of your I thought. And then um, that that will cause physiological changes in your body. But you you just keep doing that practice. And the guy who was the master of that, um, Ramana Maharshi, he did that for nine years nonstop. Where, and he would just eat like a little thimble of food that somebody would bring to him. And otherwise, he refused to see anybody, like even his own mom, he refused to see her. And that, and that so that's, that's one way. That's what they call yana yoga, which is just a mind exercise to empty out the mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so this is trying to it's trying to listen to the source, trying to listen to the space between your thoughts. That's what this is. To, that's that's what they call um, vichara. It's it's like it means investigating the source of your thoughts and you're doing it based on listening. So it's actually musical um, resonance. And then eventually you experience this energy that that it the energy will emanate out of the center of the brain, the third eye, and it will be an ether that interconnects you with the everything around you, but especially other people. And so you can have telepathy in that sense because it's a non-local, non-local energy, and it's also information. And so the center of your brain will transduce all the perceptions around you and including what's inside other people, like their thoughts and feelings. And it you will immediately holographically feel it from the future inside of your own body. And so all of a sudden you realize that our external perception is in the past and our and the future exists inside our body at holographically. <laughs> all right. Well, I need to go work on the um Well, this is I, I gave the um this is why I'm doing the live stream now because I just listened to um Gerard DeHoof's uh Eternal Black Hole talk. He's a Nobel Prize physicist and his he has a very fascinating argument that from the outside we can never interact with the inside of a black hole. And what happens is when a photon goes into the black hole, it instantaneously goes out the other side of the black hole as a non-local, um, non-locality inside the black hole. Now he's saying if you went, if you were inside the black hole, you would not observe anything. You'd be in the, the vacuum as black, you know, but it'd be pure non-local quantum information. And so that's why this is also the point of meditation that you can achieve and experience that quantum non-local information directly uh, through quantum biology the as far as circuits i will say the very first qigong master i experienced i was so skeptical i called up the number on this poster and i asked for half off and so i could hear the qigong master in the background because the chinese lady and she said yeah you can come for half off so i just had to pay ten dollars i brought my girlfriend we were both there she did this demonstration this was 1995. It was St. Mary's University in Minneapolis. Um, her name is Effie P. Chow, and she just she just left her body like last year. Um, and so she had us. She said, "I'm going to fill the room with chi." She had somebody walk towards her. She said, "Can you feel the chi?" She's the lady. The lady's like, "Yeah." And then she's like, "Okay, I want you to put your palms facing each other and make chi balls." And I felt I felt a really strong um, magnetic force pushing my palms apart. And I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. And then we were about to leave and pe most of the people left already. All of a sudden this security guard walks in and she's like a student worker. 
uh, like a younger lady. And she says, I'm just wondering what's going on in here because the fuse got blown in the room behind you. And um, at that point, um, Effie P. Chow, I didn't hear her say anything. Like it wasn't some, you know, demonst it wasn't like a show show thing. Like pretty much everybody's gone. And I just kind of got freaked out. I'm like, all right, let's go. <laughs> so that she blew a fuse. Like you got it. That's like at least 12 amps, right? Like, you know. Um, another part of the, the Qigong master training is they have to, they have to light a light bulb directly with their, with their chi and it's a 40 watt light bulb. Now, I don't know, um, you know, what wiring they have, but you can figure out what amps that is. You know, it's like, um, what they tested, um, John Chang and I, I made a, I, I made a playlist. Well, Nay Gong is Qigong. It's. Those are all just words. Like the, the communist government insisted on calling it Qigong. Nei Gong is internal martial arts. It's also called Nei Dong. Nei Dong means internal alchemy. Um, but the, what um what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, John John Chang, there's a there was he's probably the most famous video on YouTube about uh Qigong Master, and they went and tested him. And um they tried to get a reading of voltage or or amps, I can't remember which, but um He's like, well, my yang, my yang is my um, navel, my yang, and my yin is the per perineum. So why don't you put the test probes there? And they could not get any reading. Of, um, and meanwhile, there, he's shocking people. Like people would hold his hand and he would zap them. They'd jump back. And so then they had him hold a, an LED bulb. And sure enough, he could light up the LED. Now, to me, that, that proves because – like the Qigong master I trained with, uh, Chen Yilin, when he looks at you and he sends sends you healing energy, it feels just like a laser. It's literally a laser. So the biophotons are proven to be coherent laser energy. So we have – our brain operates on 25 watts, but it actually – that power originates from coherent biophotons. So when we turn um, – two-thirds of our brain power is used for external vision. So as soon as we close our eyes and start visualizing light, we're creating a 17 watt laser and now you can buy a laser, but the point is, is that that laser energy is being harm harmonized from the future based on quantum non-locality. And that's why it's able to heal any kind of blockage you have, you know, based on if you keep meditating, of course, there's certain, you have to know the tricks of non-commutativity, um, you know, for like, it's different for males and females, the, you know, like the, the left hand is yang, the lower body is yin, the right hand is yin, the upper body is yang. So as soon as you put your left hand in front of your navel as the lower body and your right hand in front of the upper body, you've just created a battery of free energy. Because you know the secret of non-commutativity, you just, you just attach yin to yang and yang to yin. And if you stand there with your legs bent, you will feel a magnetic field build up. And if you keep doing it, like you can align that with the, the planet too. Like if you meditate during the solstice and you've been meditating a lot, I, I got a strong electrical shock in the center of my brain. I, I used to like um when our furnace would turn on, you know, like the, the electrical switch for the uh, natural gas, the propane furnace, I would get a shock in the middle of my brain immediately like that. <laughs> Okay. Hey, Paul. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't looking at the comments because I've been ranting. Um. Yeah, that's one way of thinking about it. There's different kinds of chi. There's yang chi, there's yin chi, and then there's wan chi. What wan chi is the cosmic original chi. So in alchemy, the yang the yang chi is with your physical body, it's basically like your um, positive ions. And it's so it's attached, it's based on potassium. You wanna build up your potassium connected to your vagus nerve and also the uh, neural hormones and the neurotransmitters. So you're building up the serotonin and then you're also building up the oxytocin. You'll feel your glands get hot as you train. You'll feel your kidneys will get really hot. Then your thymus will get really hot. And then the center of your brain, the pineal gland, will get really hot. And then you'll start 
experiencing these really strong um, magnetic fields. And then um, your skull, your skull will actually open up the fontanelle just like a baby. It'll open up again and your skull will pulsate. Um, you'll feel the chi pulsating through your skin and the bones will pulsate. And then they call that, they actually call that fetus, fetal breathing, fetus breathing, because you're like, you're, you're returning back to your, your state when you're in the womb, your energy is harmonized, um, you know, through the, what they call the lower dantian, which is the, where the umbilical cord goes in. It's, that's, that's the elixir field. And that's where you store up, store up the cosmic wan chi. And the way you do that is you have to swallow your cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid gets ionized from the bio photons. And so when you have your eyes closed, you rotate your eyes because your left eye is um, yang shen and yin chi. And the right eye is yang chi and yin shen. So when you rotate in them, then you are creating the non-commutative time and frequency to resonate with the virtual photons. And that, and that will then get stored in the cerebral spinal fluid. And as, as that builds up, it'll naturally flow out through the sinus cavity and they call it um, amrita, which is like the ambrosia. It'll be like a really sweet taste. And then as you swallow that down, it'll create this super strong heat in your small intestines. And then you're not supposed to have any food. And then it'll absorb back into your, like through the stomach, you know, back into the small intestines. And that's how you store up the wan chi as like this virtual um, photon energy that then when you have the eyes open, it'll go back outside. It'll immediately like shoot, shoot out of your eyes as a non-local laser energy. And so the secret to keeping that energy in your small intestines is to flex your sphincter. And of course, nobody wants to say that because it's like the, um, you know, to keep your sphincter flexed all the time. It's like <laughs> nobody wants to think about that or do it. But that's like the secret to storing up your energy and to keep because it's all based on frequency, the holographic signals. OK, you can see my training manual for all the details. I have a free um, training manual. Uh, if you go to my first upload, you get the link. So this all this elect all this external technology is it all it's it's going against the natural energy of the earth um, from our biology, from our evolution. So that's why we have the ecological crisis on earth and everybody's you know, trying to solve it through some kind of external technology, but they don't realize that the foundation of reality is this black hole. Um, there's a guy, he's on the BioNears channel and he calls it the cosmic um, womb that he experienced you know, when his third eye opened up and so the original human culture calls it re-entry into first creation. And when, and, the, and like most people know, like from the aboriginals in Australia, they call it rainbow time. So it's this idea that all that matters actually photons. And then you can resonate with the source of the photons to recharge your energy. Um, but as Westerners, we've been fixated on, you know, external technology with this idea that we're not dependent on um, ecology or whatever it is. So, so, so the global warming is just going to keep getting worse. And so there's, there's 1,200 gigatons of pressurized methane in the world's largest ocean shelf, the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. And just a five gigaton release of that methane will double the atmospheric temperature. And so it's already starting to release out the methane in being released in the atmosphere in the East Siberian Arctic shelf is already more methane than the rest of the world's oceans combined. But even the world's experts on methane will not discuss the East Siberian Arctic shelf methane. They ignore it. And the IPCC reports have tried to dismiss it. <clears throat> but um, there was a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2021, Julia Steinbach, saying that um, 
that an abrupt eruption is a probable event of this East Siberian Arctic Shelf methane. But you know, most scientists they're they're still controlled by um, whatever corporate government government control they have. But the thing is, is that the point being is that you know Mother Nature is taking revenge because our the CO two emissions now by t- technology are a hundred times greater rate than any time in the past 500 million years on earth. And so when you, and then, so the, there's natural feedbacks to that where the, this methane is coming out of the Arctic and it's just going to like literally cause biological annihilation of life on earth that you can Google that term biological annihilation in the Google scholar. And there's lots of papers by conservation biologists and they're discussing the imminent biological annihilation. There was one talk on YouTube about biological annihilation by the Stanford uh, conservation biology professor and no comments at all and hardly any views. And so I commented, you know, I said, well, that just proves how, you know, we're doomed because like almost all of physics, they, they might mention global warming, but they don't really discuss it in detail. You know, this, there's one guy, Jim Massa, and he's an oceanographer. He has a PhD in oceanography and a research. He, he researched in Alaska. He lives in Alaska. And he's like the only YouTube channel where he will discuss. He worked um, directly with the, the Russian scientists that had been researching this East Siberian Arctic Shelf methane. So he knows them. He knows they're good scientists. And so he's the only one who will discuss this in detail. Um, Peter Wadham. He shared his office with Stephen Hawking at Cambridge, and he he focused on this this East Siberian Arctic Shelf methane, and then he got let go, you know, from Cambridge, so he's no longer there. Um, and they, as to why, it's hard to say, but that's that's the speculation is that he was focusing on information that most most scientists don't even want to hear about. Anyway, I gotta I gotta get going. Thanks for letting me rant. Um, and I have the link for the um, Gerard DeHoof talk in the video description. So I encourage people to listen to Gerard DeHoof. It's a fascinating talk on the what he calls the eternal black hole uh, model as the foundation of reality. And everybody, hope you have a nice time the rest of your day. (laughs) Okay, thanks.